This is the video for B4.1 on adaptation to the environment, which is all part of the standard level or core curriculum. Now, a big section of this topic is just understanding vocabulary. So when we say habitat, what we're talking about are the physical conditions um, where an organism or species or population lives. So we're talking about kind of like those abiotic things, right? So these emperor penguins, so cute, they live on this uh, Antarctic land fast ice. That ice is their habitat. And I just mentioned this word abiotic. Abiotic means non-living. So bio means living. Abiotic, non-living. So these are those things in an ecosystem like water or temperature or sunlight or precipitation um, that give that ecosystem its characteristics, it tends to have more of an influence in extreme environments. So like deserts or like this Antarctic um, ice here. So when we're thinking about what drives the natural selection processes in different organisms, we really want to have these abiotic components in mind. And here's a great example of that. So let's take a look at these grasses. These are grasses that grow on sand dunes. And this is really challenging because these sand dunes tend to have very low water availability. Um, and partially that's due to having a high salt concentration. Also just sand is messy and it gets in the way of lots of things. So there are adaptations that these grasses have to deal with these abiotic components. Again, water, salt, and sand are all abiotic. So we'll find that these grasses have a thick waxy cuticle that reduces water loss from transpiration that's on the outside of their leaves. They're going to have stomata in the bottom of their leaves, but they will be in pits. So if you look at the underside of their leaves, instead of just having stomata, those stomata, those openings will be in pits and those pits are often lined with hairs to help capture moisture and reduce the difference in humidity between the inside of the leaf and the outside. So that's pretty cool. They will also roll up their leaves to reduce wind exposure. They may have rhizomes that can extend upwards if they're covered by sand. So these are kind of like root like structures and they have fruit tans in their roots. And these are structures that are going to have um, some influence over how much osmosis can occur in the root tissue. Again, we want to make sure if we're a grass living in this environment with low water availability, that we're taking advantage of every bit of water um, availability that we can. So just in general, it's not that we need to know every single structure, but we need to have this concept of form and function from theme B, form and function in mind when we're thinking about how the abiotic components um, can really drive some evolution in the organisms that live in those habitats. Similarly, these mangrove trees um, have some unique adaptations to their environment. So their environment is not necessarily dry, it's waterlogged and they are covered with water and anaerobic soil. So this is soil that lacks um, or has very low oxygen availability. There's also a very high salt concentration in there. So some great and really cool adaptations of these plants. They can have special glands that expel that excess salt. Um, their roots are coated in cork to prevent too much salt from being absorbed. And they tend to also grow closer to the surface. So you'll see these roots here and it's unusual to see tree roots. They're normally under the soil, but remember in this case, the soil is anaerobic. So increasing that, um, you know, oxygen availability by growing roots in different places is very cool. Same thing with vertical root branches and then having a high mineral content in the roots that can drive that osmosis process and end up with more water in the roots. Okay. Remember, water always follows a high solute concentration. So again, examples of how organisms have evolved and adapted to dealing with some of those abiotic challenging components in their habitat.
Now, animals and plants don't live everywhere. I know sometimes I think that mosquitoes must live everywhere. I always find them. But even things like mosquitoes are only going to be distributed in some parts of the planet, right? So we call those the species distribution. When I think about where a species um, can be found and can live, that's its distribution. Animal distributions tend to um, revolve around where is the water available? Um, is that a temperature that they are evolved to live in? Um, and this can be different for different life stages. So um, especially with aquatic animals, we may have them living in one part um, during one of their life stages and another part in others. Plant distributions often de also depend on water availability and temperature, but they also have to be specially evolved for light conditions and soil conditions. Um, some plants prefer acidic soil, other plants not so much. They need different mineral contents or they're adapted to live in different salinity. So these are all abiotic components that can affect distribution of species. These components are all called limiting factors. They are things in the environment that limit where something can live. And so when we think about this idea of limiting factors, we all often have to think about a range of tolerance, okay? So range of tolerance means I'm gonna think about a specific factor, like let's say temperature, and I know that humans can live between this temperature and this temperature but mosquitoes um, have a different range and polar bears have a different range. So this range of tolerance um, is the range of a certain factor that an organism can survive in. So again, we talked about temperature for animals, um, for plants, maybe some of them are gonna thrive in the shade and not the sun. So how do we find these things? Well, the first thing you might do is take a species, any species that you have in mind, and make a map of where that species species lives. Then you can cross-lay that or overlay that with a map of abiotic variables. So I can take a map and I can look at, okay, is there a similar pattern in rainfall? Or is there a similar pattern in temperature? Or is there a similar pattern in sunlight? Okay, and so this helps determine the range of tolerance for that species. Again, cross-referencing where it actually lives with some of the abiotic variables. One of the sampling methods that we want to take a look at here is something called a transect. So a transect is a line that's going to span several different levels of a specific variable. So let's say I want to take a look at this mountain. That's what this is. This is a mountain. And when I think about what makes mountain habitats different, they're at different altitudes, okay? So let's say at the bottom of this mountain, we're at like, I don't know, 500 meters above sea level, and at the top of this mountain, we're at like 2,000 meters above sea level. That difference in altitude could potentially make a huge difference in um, where species is able to live. So what you would do is you would take a line that spans those different ranges. So I have a line from 500 meters to 2000 meters. And if I want to look at like, let's say some trees, a species of tree, what I can do is I can measure that abiotic variable. So I would measure my altitude and then I can count the number of organisms. So at 500 meters, I'm counting a lot more trees. As I start to go up to maybe like a thousand meters, there's less and less. At like 1,500, there's really not a lot. And then at 2,000, there's none. So this transect is, again, going to help me determine the range of tolerance um, of that variable for that species. Now, one of the ecosystems that we'll highlight here is a coral reef. And a lot of students make the mistake of thinking that a coral reef is just one organism. But a coral reef is actually an ecosystem. There are lots of different populations down here. So I see not only different types of corals, but I'm looking at different types of fish. And then also there are algae living in here. So the zooxanthellae algae has a mutualistic relationship with the coral. 
people. So all of these living things combined with the abiotic factors make coral reefs an ecosystem, not a single uh, organism or population. Now, that mutualistic uh, relationship between the algae and the coral um, requires the algae to photosynthesize. And so that's going to determine the range of tolerance for those algae. Okay, so it's going to need a shallow depth so that light can reach it. That water needs to be clear again to make sure the light is reaching the algae. It needs a slightly alkaline pH which is a problem if we have things like lots of carbon dioxide that's acidifying the ocean water, and it needs a certain range of salinity. So in order for this mutualistic relationship to persist, we need a relatively narrow range of tolerance for all of these things. And it's one of the problems with coral reefs and our changing ecosystems due to climate change is that we're finding ourselves out of this range of tolerance for these algaes and the corals are actually expelling the algaes. So we need to make sure that we have a full understanding of how all of the organisms in an ecosystem depend on this range of tolerance um, when we're trying to consider how human impacts um, can potentially um, affect these ecosystems. So let's jump back to land for just a second, okay? We're gonna look at abiotic factors, so non-living things that determine terrestrial biomes. Now this word terrestrial means on land. So we are looking at biomes that are on land, things like tundras or things like deserts, okay? Rainforests, that kind of stuff. And the distinction between those different biomes is caused by a difference in either temperature or precipitation, or both. And I wanna take a look at this biome called a grassland. Okay, now when we say biomes, what we mean are collections of ecosystems that share similar abiotic um, conditions, right? So you can tell that this grassland where this emu lives, okay, is very similar to the grassland where this ostrich lives, okay? And so even though emus are living in Australia and ostriches are living in Africa, they have a very similar ecosystem. What's interesting about this is that similar biomes or similar ecosystems tend to produce similar challenges. And these challenges tend to produce uh, organisms that evolve to have similar features, okay? So this is an example of convergent evolution where you have two different ancestors Okay, that don't necessarily, they don't converge into a single um, organism, but they tend to produce organisms that have similar traits. That's different than divergent evolution. So divergent evolution is one common ancestor that diverges into two separate ancestors or two separate species. These, convergent evolution, two separate ancestors that produce still separate species, but they tend to have similar adaptations because they're facing similar challenges in their habitats. And so when I'm looking at a map here, even um, organisms that are separated, we would still expect them to have similar features if they have similar biomes. So for example, even though this part of Canada and this part of Russia are separated, I would still expect organisms that are native to those parts to have similar adaptations because these environments have similar um, abiotic features. Okay, and we can look at that the same with multiple biomes. Okay, so we talked about um, the biomes like where the ostrich and the emu live being the same. We can make that case here too. A great example of how convergent evolution works. Now let's look at a couple of examples. So we'll start with hot deserts. Yes, you have to say a hot desert because deserts can also be cold. Okay, remember there are two abiotic factors that determine a biome, the temperature and the precipitation. Okay, so there are cold deserts and they are different. Hot deserts have really hot days, um, but the nights are very cool. So we tend to get these large fluctuations in temperature throughout a 24 hour cycle. 
There's also very low rainfall and because of that, limited soil availability and the soil is usually very nutrient poor. So the organisms that have evolved to thrive in these conditions will have very specific adaptations including this saguaro cactus. So this is a cactus um, that has really cool adaptations like these big fat stems. Those are there to store water. They also have modified leaves, so they don't have these big flat leaves like a house plant. They have modified leaves. They've turned into spines and that's to reduce the surface area. They also have this big thick coating of a waxy cuticle along the outside to reduce water loss from transpiration, a really wide root system to collect as much water as possible. And then they have something called cam metabolism. So you don't have to know the ins and outs of this, but what we should know is that this is a way to do photosynthesis at night. And that's really great because that means the stomata can open for gas exchange at night when it's cooler outside therefore losing less water due to transpiration. Now, this is just an example of one organism in one hot desert. I would expect other plants in other hot deserts to also have very similar adaptations. But what about animals? Well, how about this cute animal? This is a fennec fox and it is well adapted for life in the hot desert. It's nocturnal like a lot of desert animals are and so that allows it to be most active during the parts of the day where it's cooler. It has long hair to help it moderate its body temperature. Again, that's a protection against those wild swings in temperature between daytime and nighttime. These ears, you might think that they are for listening, but they're actually there to radiate heat. This fox can send blood to its ears, okay, and that blood can then spread out, and then you have more contact with relatively cooler air outside. That blood cools down a bit and then returns back to the body. So very cool adaptation, much like the African elephant ears. It also has hairs covering its paws to allow it to walk on hot ground, and this light fur allows it to reflect sunlight. So again, I would expect very similar adaptations in other animals um, that are adapted for similar conditions. Tropical rainforests have um, a very different set of uh, temperature and precipitation. Um, and then that means that the species that live there are also going to have really different adaptations when you compare them to desert organisms. So things living in the rainforest have to be adapted for like really hot temperatures with a lot of rainfall and there's a lot of light intensity. Most of these are found near the equator. And a great example of an organism well adapted for that is this Maranti tree. Now this is a tree that is able to grow very tall and relatively quickly, and that's really amazing to be able to outcompete other trees for light. So even though there is a high light intensity in the rainforest, there are also lots of other things that can live there, right? Because the temperature is pretty nice and all kinds of things. So it's gotta be able to outcompete those other organisms. All right, so if it's growing really tall, that means there's a lot of mass to support. So this very dense trunk helps to support um, its very tall growth. It also has enzymes for photosynthesis with optimal temperatures that are a little bit above what we might find in other ecosystems. And it has these nice broad leaves to disperse rainfall. These leaves are also going to stay on all year long. They're evergreen so that they can utilize that light intensity and photosynthesize all year round. So just like the saguaro cactus and the maranti tree are different because they have different habitats, so are the spider monkey and the finnick fox, okay? So this spider monkey has much different adaptations than the fox. I don't see huge ears on this monkey. What I see are things that are well adapted for its environment. So long limbs for climbing through those trees. There's not a lot of trees in the desert, so it's not surprising that I'm not finding organisms with long limbs there. Um, it's active during the day. So that's much different than the fox, which was active during the night. And this is because it's gotta be to see and <laughs> it needs to be able to find food and it's also got another tail that can act almost like another limb um, great for grasping or for climbing so the key here is not memorizing individual adaptations of every single organism and every single type of ecosystem it's about understanding the relationship between form and function this is theme b so form and function what 
physical adaptations do organisms have to help them cope with the challenges in their environment?